So over the last six weeks, we've been talking about abundance, having more than enough. Now, I'd like you to humor me for just a few minutes because I want to I want to go somewhere that uh, won't necessarily happen. But like I said, humor me. I want you to think for a moment that you are going to bed tonight. You put your head on your pillow, you go to sleep. And then in the middle of the night, God shows up and he says to you, I want to give you your heart's desire. And I I want you to tell me what that is. And I don't want you to just tell me what that is. I want you to make me a list. Give me, give me your top five things you would like to receive from me in abundance, never ending, ever flowing, coming from me. What would be on that list? Take just a moment and think about what you would say in your dream to God. Now, certainly in your mind, uh, for, for a lot of people in your minds going, wait a minute, this is, this is like a church service. So I've got to think God answers. And so you're immediately going, I got to do this, 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 and this. And, and, and actually your first tendency would have been, you know, things for the here and the now, the things that would make you more comfortable, that would make life less difficult, whatever it might be. Uh, for Solomon, he said, give me wisdom. That was the, that was top on his list. But I've got to think, regardless of where you ended in your list, when it comes to abundance, what probably did not make your list is the word peace. This um, idea that peace would be uh, given in a way that is never ending. Because oftentimes we think of peace as either having it or not having it. Back, um, you know, 300 years before Jesus came on the scene, uh, the Greeks um, worshipped the goddess Irene. The goddess Irene is a goddess of peace. In fact, after, I think it was in uh, 275 AD, they actually erected a, a statue to worship because they had won a battle against the Spartans and uh, they... Um, uh, they worshipped this Irene, who in one hand had a horn, and that horn was uh, representative of plenty. And then in the other hand was ultimately, there, there was a spear sort of thing, but it had an olive branch on it, because uh, you, when you had plenty and you were at peace, everything was okay. And so they worshiped that believing that in the springtime, when that was kind of her whole thing in the springtime, when it was the normal time for the campaigns of war to begin, she would make sure that they lived in peace, which of course they didn't. What's also interesting is that, that we don't, we don't worship the God of, of, of peace with this idol. But I think what COVID-19 has done, it has, um, it's um, exposed or shown us uh, the idols that we've put up in our life that that we wouldn't have maybe titled our bank account as the God of peace, but we sure think of our bank account as the God of peace or our career as the God of peace or our, our mobility, our ability to go anywhere, whenever we want at any time as uh, a God of peace. But But God came along and removed all of those and uh, we were uh, we found ourselves in a place of going, well, I once had peace and now I don't have peace. I believe that the generation of children that that now they would call them the Z generation, the children that are, you know, still in the, you know, maybe the, the older part of the Z generation would be 15, 16, 17. They're watching their parents in this monumental time in history. And they're watching their parents' reaction, and they're watching their parents' lives. And as they're watching, they're getting modeled either a life of peace or a life of anxiety and fear. And uh, it's important that as parents that uh, we understand that it's in these times that ultimately our children are seeing what we as people truly worship. Because when the things that we worship are taken away and fear and anxiety come in, then the things that we were worshiping are ultimately, they were wrong. Now, I, I do believe there's some maturing that the Lord wants us to do with this, uh, this idea of peace. Because peace is not something that you either have or you don't have, according to Scripture. Scripture gives us a, a much more comprehensive look 
at what peace is. So peace, well, to a certain extent, does mean the absence of conflict. In, in biblical terms and in biblical example, it also means the presence of something greater. So it's not just the lack of something, it's the presence of something greater. In fact, Job said these words, which I think are profound for us. He said, you shall know that your tent is in peace. You shall visit your dwelling and find nothing amiss. What the, what the Jews understood is that life, and we understand this too, but we don't often think about it, is that life is complex. Uh, there's, no, there's nothing simple about life. And because they understood that life was complex, they understood that peace brought simplicity or literally brought an alignment to life that was formally out of line. So a good example would be uh, would be the, the usage of shalom in the verb sense could, would be, mean wholeness, but given in the right context, the wholeness of a wall where many pieces or many bricks or many rocks are brought together to make something that is larger and it becomes whole. Peace has more to do with um, alignment and wholeness than the absence of conflict, at least as it, as it relates to scripture. So when Isaiah looking forward to Jesus, he says, there's a coming of the Prince of Peace. In other words, Jesus came and he's this leader who was at perfect peace. He, he was not, not in the absence of conflict with the Father. He, there was no conflict, but he himself was whole. Why? Because what happens is that way back in the garden with Adam and Eve, sin, when it entered in, it took the simple life and it made it complex. It made it, it made it difficult because there, there was conflict between humanity and God. And, uh, there was, uh, there was conflict and complexity now between relationships between men and women and men and men and women and women. It's all the reasons you have war and all of that other things. But even greater than that, there became a complexity. There became a disorder. There became a disjointedness about the inside of an, a uh, person's own personhood in their soul it became fractured so when so when uh, Isaiah looked at Jesus and he looked at Jesus as coming he looked at someone who was perfect in perfect harmony and perfect alignment within himself and perfect alignment with his heavenly father and so he ultimately by going to the cross did what we could not do he lived a life of peace. So he became our peace. And Paul said that he broke down the walls of hostility because the 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 sin uh, really put us at war with the Heavenly Father. And when Jesus came and went to the cross, the Heavenly Father poured out his wrath. He pulled it, poured out his anger upon Jesus so that he took our sufferings. He took the things that we deserved. And so he became our peace. And so when Paul is writing, and Paul, by the way, uh, he, of all people that had uh, a, a right or a reason to have anxiety and fear, it's Paul. Uh, and, and Paul's life, as you just take a survey of it, certainly he could look at life and say, what if, and how are these things? But he understood that peace could not be found within himself. Peace had to be found from another. And when you found the other being Jesus, and Jesus becomes your peace, and you receive Jesus as your peace, then you can have peace while the world is in chaos, while the world is out of order, while all the pieces don't fit together in your world, whether close or as a whole. Um, I'm talking the whole whole world. Uh, you can still have order, alignment, wholeness, completeness within yourself. And what Paul ultimately modeled in his life is that peace is not an antidote, but a way of life that is ever expanding and growing in its abundance. Now, this is important. So let me say this again. Peace is not an antidote. It's a way of life that's ever expanding and growing in its abundance. Now, it's, it's, it's this backdrop of peace that Paul understood and lived day by day that he writes here in Philippians 4 
and uh, verses four through eight. Let me read it to you. It says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known, be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these, these things. And the God of peace will be with you. Now, he understood that, that peace wasn't an antidote, but a, but a lifestyle. And when you understand that it's a lifestyle, things begin to change. How does it become a lifestyle? Why I want to take just a few moments and focus on that out of this verse. Because it becomes a lifestyle when you understand that, that peace is relational, peace is revelational, and then peace is sensational. And when you really walk through these realities, then peace is ever expanding and peace is ever growing in your life. Now, he, Paul said, don't worry about anything. And when he uses that word worry or anxiety, it literally means that, that you are being pulled in many different directions. So when COVID-19 hit, for me personally, I'm sitting in my TV room and obviously there are the words out there and things are going on. But when it became real for me, I'm sitting and I'm watching the Dallas Mavericks game and I'm watching the Dallas Mavericks game. It was a Wednesday or a Thursday and I'm watching it partly because I'm a big Luca fan. Uh, but the other reason is that my son and I, Josh, we had tickets to go to the Dallas Mavericks and Phoenix Suns game on Saturday. I had great seats. was really excited about going. And it's uh, they come out after halftime and they come on with this kind of NBA news breaking story that the Utah Jazz have canceled their games. And in that moment, there just became this realization that chaos is going to enter life. And it entered through the NBA of all places. Go figure. And it did. It Everything began to change after that moment. And all over the world, people literally began to, to, to go, what are we going to do? Now, I want to pause. And I'm going to come back to this because I want to give you this quote from Dallas Willard. Dallas Willard says, says this. He says, Ultimate freedom we have as human beings is the power to select what we will allow or require our minds to dwell upon. So think about this. The ultimate power that God has given us is this ability to control where our minds go. The thoughts that really come out of our minds. So whenever the world, whether it's the whole world with COVID-19 or it's your world through a divorce or a loss of job or it's your world because of a wayward son or daughter or a parent that is uh, abusive, whatever, whatever it is, when, when your world is thrown into chaos, God has given this freedom of mind to choose where we will go in that moment. When you, Paul understood that it was first and foremost, peace was relational. So for him, he had this mind muscle memory that caused him to immediately turn toward his relationship with the heavenly father first. And because he went there first, uh, things began to change. And so what, what he says, he says that um, don't be anxious ab about anything. But even before he says that, he uses these words. And, and I think that we need to understand these words that he said. He said, the Lord is at hand. He understood the proximity of God in every season, in every situation of life. When you understand the proximity of the Lord in every situation or every situation of life, it will change your response in your head. If you go quickly to worry and you go quickly to what, you know, I really think is is kind of a false prophet thinking, what if this happens, that'll happen, this will happen, that'll happen. Instead of going to the Lord, then anxiety will grow in your heart. But if you understand the Lord is near, 
that he's at hand, then that proximity will cause you to turn to him quickly. And so he says, the Lord is at hand. So be anxious for nothing, for nothing, but in, but, um, in everything, prayer, supplication, and thanksgiving. So prayer is this, um, Prayer is this um, general uh, form of relationship. It's this 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 broad scope that Jesus brought when he when the disciples came to him and said, "Teach us to pray." And he said, "Pray like this: Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen." This 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 prayer is is about divine devotion and adoration and desire for what God wants. It's, 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 it's not a, a kind of this rote repetition of just yelling things out to the Lord, hoping to get something from God, but it's just recognition that, that we are a needy people and he's a generous God who wants to help us out on a daily basis. And so that's that starting place of prayer. But he goes a step further and he says that supplication, supplication, it kind of zeroes in. And, and I think that if there's a time for supplication to really come in, it's, it's in the COVID-19. For me as a pastor, there's not a manual to go to how do you lead a church during COVID-19. And you know, there's a blessing from that. Now, I'm going to come back to that. I'm going to just set that on the shelf because there is a blessing on that. But I'm going, Lord, what do we do? And we have to bear down here because I don't have the answers. And so this supplication is really, it's really coming to the Lord uh, about the the. Uh, with a with an earnestness of the need. There's nothing wrong with coming to God with the earnestness of the need, and and we live in a world where the earnest of the need, earnestness of needs it they're, they're quite high. And so coming to the Lord, He He takes great pleasure in us coming to Him in those moments. But this is so critical. He says with thanksgiving. I think there's the there's the prayer and there's the there's the the supplication. But I think in all of it, it should end in this adoration of thanks of God. Thank you for your goodness and your kindness, because Lord. Not only is it shown in scripture, I can look in my own life and I can see where you have shown yourself to be faithful. And so it's, it's in this relationship that I am, I am coming in this place of prayer and I'm saying, Lord, um, uh, you've got the answer. You are my peace. Now, the moment, the moment you've positioned yourself and you have said, you're my peace, then that has said, you've, you've said by default that you are an ambassador. You're only the deliverer now of peace. You, you only receive the, the peace from the king, and then you take it places. And so you, in this relationship, you've said, you're my answer. You're the answer to all the disorder. You're the answer to all the conflict. And I'm telling you something, we've even seen in our government, uh, once again, has in their in their wonderfulness, has stepped up to the American people and have said, "We will be your peace. We will bring order to your finances. We will bring order to the rampant virus. We will." And so, the American people, once again, with just the the hook, line, and sinker, have been reeled in to a false sense of peace. Because while they can bring peace, maybe for a moment, they are not peace. And when you are in relationship with peace, it becomes something powerful. It becomes revelational. It becomes revelational. Why? Because when, when you move into this, as Paul says, he says, the, and the peace of God, which surpasses, there's this picture of a hand over a head that you can't reach. It surpasses the, our, our hearts and minds. It, it, it surpasses and guards it in a way that we can't understand it. I want to read, I want to read, I just love the way the message version brings out this, this verse seven. It says this, it says, before you know it, a sense of God's wholeness, everything coming together for good will come and settle you down. It's wonderful what happens when Christ displaces worry at the center of your life. Do you know, in spiritual terms, in, in biblical terms, we get, the, we get the picture of revelation and what is revelational by being able to go behind the veil in the temple, behind the tail in the, 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 uh, 
the veil in the temple uh, is the Ark of the Covenant. And in the, the middle of the Ark of the Covenant resided the presence of God. And, and as we come into the presence of God in this wonderful relationship that we've been called into, we've come into the perfection of light. And when you come into the perfect, perfection of light, shadows and darknesses are removed and things are revealed. And what is revealed ultimately is what is out of alignment, first and foremost, in your own heart, in your own soul. And that revelation brings an alignment. It brings a calm to the chaos because it's out of this relationship that you, you are there and being revealed to the one who walked in the middle of the storm on the water, to the one who looked at the storm and said, peace be still. And he's able to reveal to your hearts the things that are of this world, the things that are of this life, the things that are passing away, the things that, that we so desperately try to hold on to. And he comes along and says, oh, my dear child, my dear friend, let that go. Let me show you a better way. Let me show you something more precious. That can't happen out of religion. So oftentimes we, we set up religion as this altar of peace. And I'm telling you, religion can't bring that kind of order. Daniel, he's taken and he's put in the middle of the lion's den. And the Bible doesn't record it. I think it would have if this happened. But I, I can't believe that Daniel went into the lion's den kicking and screaming. He, he, didn't, he didn't go into the lion's den going, I have my rights. I'm an American. You can't do this to me. I don't think that happened. I think that as you look at Daniel chapter six, you find that Daniel, he was in a place of prayer. It says this, prayer and thanksgiving it was a lifestyle for him. He had this lifestyle of, of looking to the God of heaven. And so he went in, in the middle of what he, everyone in the world knew was going to be this split second of chaos where his flesh was getting ripped to sheds, shreds. And he, he took a moment and probably pet the lion and scratched underneath the belly and pet the paws, whatever he did, because he knew and was in relationship with the God of peace. And there was this revelation of heart that helped him to recognize there was nothing no kind of chaos, no kind of conflict in this life that could take away the peace that he had received from his heavenly father. Now, before we go on to sensational, I want to give you one more thing here because this is important. If religion has been your idol, if, if, if money has been your idol, because uh, I think religion and money, they kind of go hand in hand. We think we can, we can make money our idol because it fits really well into the prosperity gospel, certainly. But you can't, you can't live in the peace and chaos when you have false idols in your life. And I think that the Lord is calling much of the church back to this relational peace so that revelation doesn't have to just come from a guy on TV. It, revelation doesn't just have to come from church, Zoom church on Sunday or Saturday, but revelation can come in your morning time with the Lord, revelation time can come in the afternoon or in the evening time. Revelation can come when you're sitting in Starbucks with somebody the Lord is having you minister to. Revelation best and in its most purest form comes from the light of the throne of God. And he wants his people to position themselves in relationship to live in the light even as he is in the light. And from that, from that, peace becomes sensational. It becomes sensational. Why? Because nothing stands out in a world of chaos than people who are at peace in the middle of it. Nothing. In fact, you find that in verse 9, Paul writes these words, the things which you have learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. Paul understood his relationship with the Prince of Peace, revealed the important things in life 
so that when he is beaten and let down a, out of a, a city in a wall in a basket, stoned to death, when he is, he's thrown in jail, when life is completely uncertain, even in this situation, you find he's writing a church that is struggling with the vision, and has two people earlier in this chapter that don't even get along. He is not caught up in the chaos. His life is centered in this relationship. And being centered in this relationship always surpasses understanding because it just doesn't look right because there's not A, B, C, or D. God doesn't work that way. God surpasses our understanding. He's, he's higher and greater than the way we think and the way we feel. And from that, people stop and go, that's different. You have something that I don't have. In fact, I, there's, a, there's, a, there's a great example of uh, someone in our church that um, last year, they were uh, in, their, in their place of work. They were going through a very difficult time, very dysfunctional workplace, uh, uh, office politics at its finest. There, there was an opening for a manager and the, the assistant director uh, was, um, uh, was friends with somebody in their office, and the person they were friends with was certainly not the most qualified, and they were getting promoted to manager just because of their friendship. And everyone around them said, you need to leave, you need to find a new job, you need to get into a different department. That's just an unhealthy place. And I'll never forget these words they said. They said, God told me to stay. Now, there is a difference between a good decision, and there are a lot of people that make good decisions out of the calmness of their personhood in the middle of chaos. And a person in the middle of chaos who makes a God decision. In relationship, God will reveal his plans and purposes for you. And when you do what God wants, you have a sensational peace that only, only comes from God. Now, others may look and say, boy, that was a great decision. But you're going to be able to say, no, it was a God decision. Because for this person, within six months, they were awarded, and out of thousands of employees, they were awarded employee of the year. And were recently appointed not as a manager, but as an assistant director in another apartment, a department. Because God, when you're in relationship with the Prince of Peace, he will reveal what he wants you to do. And when he reveals what he wants you to do and you do it, he's going to do something sensational. Now, that doesn't mean your life's going to end in a promotion, but he's going to show that he's going to show that you can be at peace regardless of the chaos in your life. And I, I think that when it comes to the sensationalism, we have to understand that when Jesus gave the Sermon on the Mount, he said that blessed are those who are peacemakers because they are the children of God. Why are they the children of God? Because they are in relationship with God and they are revealed things that allow the God of peace, the Prince of peace that is in them to go to the world. And I just want to say this in closing that, that for you, it, it, it always starts, it always starts with accepting the Prince of Peace into your life. He's the Prince of Peace because right now he's just a prince, but when you let him in your, your life, he becomes the king. He becomes the ruler of your heart. And, and one of the things that you find about that, whether it's, it's false gods or religion, is that you really, in, in, in those things, you try to get the, the king to come and help you in your kingdom. But when you accept the Prince of Peace and let him be the king of his kingdom, he invites you into his kingdom. And now you're more concerned about his kingdom than your kingdom. And he's able to bring an ever-growing and expanding peace into your life. No longer is it an antidote. It becomes a way of life. For those of you that have, have now recognized that that, that, that the peace of God is not something that's abundant in your life and that you've been doing religion really well for a long time, but this showed you in an instant that, 
that you were doing religion and you weren't doing relationship and there really wasn't the revelational things going on in your life, God, he's not, he's not sitting back going, you better adjust. You better be better. That's religion. He's the Prince of Peace. He's sitting at peace saying, come, I'm at peace with you coming right back into this wonderful relationship that we can have so I can reveal the things that are out of order in your heart so you can be my child and be a peacemaker in the middle of a chaotic world. So let's pray. Father, thank you for your goodness. Lord, I love you and thank you for being my peace. That Lord, I, I, there's nothing I can do that can bring peace, but Lord, you brought peace and your perfection. And I pray that every person that hears this message about this abundant peace will say yes to the Prince of Peace so that he might become the king of their heart. Not so that all of our world becomes perfect, but that we might be in a relationship in your kingdom so that you might reveal the things that are out of order and chaotic in our life so that first those might come into alignment with your, with your kingdom. And so that, Lord, others might look at our life and be able to go, what is it that you have? So that, not that our kingdom expands, but that because we are your children, in your family, in your house, in your kingdom, that we are peacemakers and we bring your peace to a chaotic world. In Jesus' name, amen.